Pearl has spent the past 20 years coaching leaders and teams to build trusted environments where people and businesses thrive. Tara attributes her success to building inclusive teams where people feel a genuine sense of belonging, and she is committed to merging the personal, professional, and spiritual aspects of life to help people feel and be at their best. In her current role as the Global Head of Technical Adoption at Amerisys, an SAP company, she is dedicated to driving market cloud utilization to help customers realize business value with her global team of technical specialists. Tara is a spiritual connector and wisdom seeker who lives in St. Paul, Minnesota with her two teenage boys, Logan and Grayson, and husband, Mike. They have two dogs, Finn and Fiona, that help her get out for daily moving meditations. Welcome everyone to the Rebel and Be Well podcast. You may notice that today we have a little bit different background minus our Rebel and Be Well sign, but it's been graciously replaced with this gorgeous view as Tara, our guest today, and myself have been significantly upgraded, um, I would say, from the <laughs> tattoo parlor, which is awesome into the uh, self-esteem brands boardroom here. So we are going to be having a conversation today um, as we look out upon this like gorgeous hiking trail and marsh. And it's kind of fitting for our guests today because Tara is one of those people who's so connected to both herself, to the people around her, to her surroundings, that as I'm kind of looking at all of this, I'm like, this is actually the perfect setting for you. It so is Tara is an incredible human. She is a dear friend, and I'm really excited to get to know her as a professional colleague in a greater capacity too. Tara has a different um, component to what she brings to the professional world, that you're going to learn something new today. I promise you that. So Tara, when I read your bio... Yeah. You had a few things that jumped out at me, clearly. Okay. Um, but one of them being that your mission is really to merge personal, professional, and spiritual health. Yeah. And that's not very common for a leader in a company to add in that spiritual health component. And so I'm so looking forward to diving into that. Um, I know that's a space that you feel very comfortable speaking to and have so much wisdom to share. Um, and in that, I hope as an audience, you're ready for a lot of creative outside the box thinking as Tara is going to bring great intuition. She's going to bring this human connectedness to us and just this authenticity. That's so beautiful. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm excited yeah. to be here. Yeah, it's going to be a fun conversation. And so, yeah. so I want to start, um, with a couple of words that jumped out at me as I was preparing for our interview today. So you mentioned a couple of words that are so crucial and I think often missing in probably a lot of people's personal and professional lives. And that's psychological safety mm -hmm. and conscious connection, conscious conversation. Yeah. I think a lot of people can kind of wrap their head around psychological safety, but conscious conversation, I had to stop and really think about that. I'm like, what does that mean? Like, what does that look like yeah. in life? Can you just tell me a little bit about what that means for you? Like, how do you go about having these conscious conversations in your world? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. So I think consciousness is really about presence. Mm -hmm. So I think in this busy world we live in today, it can be hard sometimes to focus because we have our Slack messages pinging us, our text messages, there's an email coming in, there's something else going on. So conscious conversations to me really in the workplace is all about like, am I present when I'm talking to you? Yeah. And I'm making a heart-centered connection to you as a human, not as a, like in my head, I know the answer, mm -hmm. or I'm only listening to respond to you, not right. to really understand you. Yeah. So consciousness to me is about like full embodiment of who we we are yeah. um, in the present moment with each other mm -hmm. so that we can have this more expanded conversation. And then you, as my partner in this conversation, feels that you're being heard. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and that that I'm not judging you, that I'm creating psychological safety is probably a component mm-hmm. of it, right? Yeah. So like you feel like you can bring your most authentic self forward because I'm not a judgmental person or you don't feel threatened by me or the situation. So I think that's really a heart centered, like intention I have. How common do you think that is in people's personal and professional lives? I think it's something people have to awaken to. And so how common is it? I think people will not be as diligent about this or even know about it. But I think that they will still have practices where they know they're being present for their, whether they're having a one-on-one with their child or their partners or their colleagues. And people can feel Mm -hmm. when you're not there and you're not really listening or you're like distracted. And sometimes, honestly, I'm not perfect at this, Krista. Like if something really critical is happening at work and I'm in a conversation and something comes through on Slack and like there's a customer that needs help and it's like kind of an alert. It's Mm -hmm. a fire drill. If I'll say that, I'll say to that person, I really do want to have this conversation right now. We just have this issue going on. So I just have to make sure that we can engage the right folks on this. Do you mind if I just take a moment to do that? And Instead of just grabbing your phone and starting to text and like not look at the person, <laughs> yeah, right, you make yeah. a conscious uh-huh. decision yes. to yes. let them know yes. why you have to remove yourself from that conversation and pay attention to something else. Right. Yes. Yeah. Or even like if I'm doing like my career development discussions with my employees, mm-hmm. I shut off my notification. So I'm not going to get a Slack notification. I'm not going to look at my phone. I'm not going to, because of, in a video, I think it's really great in a one-to-one setting when you're in, in person. Right. It's easier, I think, because energetically we are in each other's energy fields. Yep. And so like our auras are interacting and all these things on the videos, yeah. it's a little bit harder. Harder, sure. I think. And so I just want to be making eye contact, have my video on, like yeah. be very present for my people yeah. so that they feel as they're going into this place of vulnerability. Honestly, mm-hmm. I'm telling my leader what I want to do next. And maybe it's not the role I'm in now right. that I am listening with a heart centered focus with that person's best interest in mind. And that brings up a really interesting point because I kind of make this assumption, which is not a good thing to do in general, (laughs) but I hear IT, right? And you're in the IT world. You have so much experience leading in the IT world. Yeah. And to me, I hear IT and I automatically go to the space of disconnection, right? Mm -hmm. In my head. I'm like, how do you, because I don't, it's such a blessing that we can stay connected via technology. Yeah. Yeah. But to me, it's almost a little bit of this artificial connection where like you, I love what you did when we sat down, like you grabbed my hand and you set an intention for our yeah. podcast today yeah, to, sure. to share something of authenticity and heart centered value to the mm-hmm. audience today. Yes. How do you do that? Like through technology? I mean, you, yeah. if anyone can do it, you can. So I'm like, <laughs> what's the secret? Yeah. Cause I feel like I'm on zoom and I'm like <laughs> off video and I'm like, you know, brushing my hair and like getting something to drink and having a little Blossing lunch, buzzing my teeth. <laughs> And then I'll put the video back on 20 minutes later. I'm so here. And it doesn't, you know, probably like it's not very authentic. So how do you, how do you get that across when you're trying to lead people, but really you're greatest time with them is going to be digitally. You know, honestly, so IT, I think IT has like, there are for sure systems, parts of IT, but I think no matter what business you're in, you're always in the business of relationship. So I've worked in the technology field pretty much my whole career. And I've always kind of been the liaison between the business Mm -hmm. and the IT folks, like translating, like what's possible, what's not possible into language that they can both hear. Yeah. And um, working with Salesforce and SAP in the last, um, you know, six years, it's really been about like, yes, technology is enabling something for the customers to be successful. Like maybe it's the emails that someone's sending, it's coming through our technology, but like the process and the people side of that is still the most important. So my thoughts and like intentions and actions in interacting is It's kind of good to have a Terra in IT Mm -hmm. because though I'm super expressive and to your point, some of the IT folks are a little bit more direct communicators. They're a little bit more introverted. Um, There is, they still are humans Mm -hmm. 
And I think it's how do you create a sense of belonging? Mm -hmm. So there's a part of that where I think it's important to know, like, I want to know you as a person before we start talking about business. Mm -hmm. So how do we have Mm -hmm. those kind of conversations? And you have to be a little careful in the IT world because there are not everyone wants to talk about their personal life. Sure. And one of my friends um, wrote this book. The Elevated Communicator, and it's all about conscious communication, yeah. and her name is Marianne O'Brien. But one of the styles is direct. Yeah. And I'm actually a direct communicator, secondary expressive. Hmm. So it is interesting. And sometimes if I take it, I'm the other way. Yeah. But I think I've learned to be as concise in my communication as possible, which yeah. the IT world really uh, like appreciates yeah. because they just want to know what do you need me to do yeah. to yeah. make this successful? Speaking their language. Yeah, yeah. Speaking their language. So I think to answer your question, like to sum it up, I would say it's about, do I connect to you as a human? Do I make you feel like you belong, yeah. that no matter what you have, and there's like some difficult conversations you have to have with your customers, with right. the technology, when you're running software as a service, not everything's 100% up 100% of the time, and yeah. that is a material impact oftentimes to the customers. Right. And so delivering these tough messages, I always just really did what I did before we talked. Yeah. Like I set an intention that optimal outcomes come through for everyone, yeah. that everyone can express their need in yeah. a way that we can understand and that yeah. we can find a resolution together. So it's just, I'd say it's about being intentional Mm -hmm. in every interaction. Mm -hmm. And if I I find if I'm not, or if I get pulled into something and it's not intentional, it can be a little bit more frantic because I think as energetic beings, like our intention matters, like Mm -hmm. energy follows intention. And that's what we're creating um, in the present moment, which is the only place we can do it. Absolutely. That's a beautiful answer. So when you, before you say get into a call or a transaction with a client or a customer, do you set that intention personally or do you set that intention with the person or a little bit of both? Usually personally. Okay. So I don't think my IT world is ready for like a... (laughs) I'm just like, that is progress. But yeah. But I mean, honestly, one yeah. time, so Target used to be one of my customers. And before we um, got into their executive meeting, which um, right. was like our top to top meeting, we yeah. would all kind of gather on the phone. And I would say sometimes like, let's set the intention yeah. that optimal outcomes come for everyone, that we learn from them, that they learn from us. And our yeah. partnership forward is even better because of it. Yeah. Like it can be simple things like that. Yeah. And people, honestly, those meetings are always so stressful yeah. because you feel like you're on stage and you have like the sea levels watching you. Mm-hmm. So talk about like needing to take deep breaths mm-hmm. or I might even say that to people. Like we're just going to do like the four box breathing exercise where you inhale it for four, exhale for yeah. four, rest, all that stuff. I think that those things really do matter. And I think intention is powerful. But to your point, do I always do that? No. I sometimes just will know that there's, when I look at my calendar for the morning, I'll know that there might be a couple meetings that will be difficult. So I'll just ask, well, I have this practice of not like, I'm imposing what I want on Krista, but I would say my intention is again, optimal outcomes or like that we can resolve this peacefully or whatever the thing is we're working through. And that only if your higher self or right. like your soul being agrees to this yeah. and otherwise there's probably a lesson in there for me. Yeah. But I find that that always makes me feel more at ease yes. having those difficult conversations. And then I do start my day with intentions. Mm-hmm. Like I'll say, I welcome in unconscious love at all levels for everyone I interact with, mm-hmm. or I welcome in, um, love, harmony, peace, and joy mm-hmm. or whatever the thing is. I mean, I do set an intention every morning before I get out of bed. Right. That is kind of a blanket intention for the right. day. And right. if I feel like it's spinning out and yeah. all the traffic lights are red, I'm like, there's something wrong. And I have to recenter reset back it. to myself. And sometimes that's just breath. And sometimes yeah. that's, again, yeah. reset a new intention for yeah. what I need. Do you think there's a crossover between emotional intelligence and intention? Oh, How do you think those two intersect? Good. So I think emotional intelligence is such a key skill in yeah. the workplace. And I think that intention can drive some of that emotional intelligence. So again, like we talked at the beginning about conscious communication. Mm -hmm. So if I'm setting an intention that I'm going to be consciously present for you as we have this conversation, then 
like, I'm going to be picking up on things. Like if you're leaning back, I'm like, yeah. oh, that was not, that was yeah. not what Krista yeah. needed. Yeah. Or I might say, hey, Krista, I noticed when someone said this, that you leaned back. Was there something that you were feeling didn't resonate for you? Right. So, and you could say, geez, Tara, no, I, please yeah. don't ask such personal questions. But, or, <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't like be careful because yeah. emotional intelligence would be part of like, is this IT person? This okay. <laughs> yeah. For me to say this in front of yeah. others. Or I might say, instead of calling them out specifically, I might say, hey, I don't know that that resonated with everyone in the room. Like, have we thought about it this way? Or could we rephrase that? Just because if you do are watching the nonverbal cues from others um, or understanding that people are not having a great day. And I think if, especially if you're in those situations where conversations are difficult, mm -hmm. no one feels excited to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Like, honestly, the stat on this is like 70% of us are avoiding a really difficult conversation at work. And it's like mm -hmm. billions of dollars of lost productivity. Really? But if we could honestly um, have more training on like this conscious communication, mm -hmm. like we want to resolve this together, like win-win synergistic. Mm -hmm. I don't need it to be about me winning and you losing. I want us to both feel like what could we agree to collaboratively and synergistically together. Right. So how does spiritual health fit into that? Because, you know, there's this, it's so interesting. Obviously, you know, my background, you know, a lot yeah. of it is centered on initially physical health and, you know, you kind of realize mental health is a lot of, part, a lot of physical health. And then you realize things like even financial health are part of physical health. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. okay, actually I think spiritual health might impact physical health yeah. the most. Oh yeah. It's, it's, and, it's, but it's this term that when you say it, yeah. I almost feel like it's like setting that intention. I'm like, are they ready to hear that word or are they <laughs> not ready to hear that word, especially in the workplace? Totally. And yeah. so how do you bring at first if you can just give me your definition of spiritual health mm -hmm. like what does that look like what does that mean yeah and then how do you bring that into your leadership yeah i think that's a great question so when i think about spiritual well-being or spiritual health i think of it in a multi-dimensional way so i think okay. we're multi-dimensional beings having an experience right now yeah. in these costumes as krista and tara yeah. and but we are energetically impacting everything around us. So I don't know if you've ever had this experience, like if you're in a really bad mood, like technology stops working for you, that does happen to mm -hmm. me. And then I know, again, I have to reset something. But I think that spiritual well-being for me is, am I connected to like the inner Tara, like yeah. the soul side of me, the, the piece of Tara that never leaves? Yeah. Um, but so like, I, I always kind of think about this, like the Tara mm -hmm. is the earth player or actress mm -hmm. in this lifetime. And when the curtains close, the being of Tara leaves. Yeah. So I think the being of all of us is like this really wise component yeah. of who we're really meant to be in this world yeah. and that we have spiritual helpers and guides and yeah. angels. And I think there's multifaceted help that we can ask for. Spiritual well-being is like just knowing, I guess, that I'm not just a human, mm -hmm. but I have this multidimensional um, existence okay. and then also this reality of we call them invisible friends around us yeah. where we can call upon even nature I think it's a very spiritual practice yeah. and I think getting out there and earthing and grounding yourself even in the winter you can do that right you can just go for a walk yeah. and see some animals and maybe hug a tree like yeah. for real right I want to normalize yeah. Leaders, this being in leadership, like leaders have capacity yeah. to not just have IQ. <clears throat> now yeah. EQ is a little bit more accepted, but could there be like an SQ? Like, yeah. could there be a spiritual intelligence? Yes. Right? yes. And you have it. Like mm -hmm. if anyone's going to teach that class, it's for sure going to be you. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm just trying to bring that forward to people just to kind of say, if you've been feeling that kind of feeling this like push and pull, yeah. You're not the only one. Mm -hmm. And you've felt the push and pull, I think, since you were probably very young. Yes. And then you just finally kind of surrendered to it and embraced it. And I know you bring it in your space. Yeah. Like, how do you do that and like just share it in those little pieces and normalize it yeah. in, this, in the path you're walking. Yeah. So I think, so I was at Salesforce for five years previous to my yeah. current role and Salesforce did a really good job of normalizing spirituality. And I think it was just like, they had meditation rooms in all their headquartered buildings. Yeah. They have a spiritual practice of like, you can take time to meditate. They have trailblazer mm -hmm. ranch, which is mm -hmm. based in nature meant to connect you to your like ultimate being higher self. Those are yeah. not the problem words that Salesforce uses. But I mean, ultimately, I think that we all feel 
when we're not centered to ourselves. And I think how I speak about it in the leadership profile right. is like, like I'm centering back to me. Yeah. I'm calibrating back to Tara. Yeah. And those are things that we can understand in a human way. Yeah. Yeah. And then again, it's like those intentions or, um, just exploring things or, or if someone's opening up to me and saying, I'm really struggling with something, right. then I might say, well, like I coach people at Salesforce. I've been yeah. an executive coach for a while. Um, I coach people now. And when they say, I just can't figure out what's going on, then I can look at their field and say, okay, mm -hmm. there's, there's things that are showing up in your field that you might need to clear. There might be some like like energy that you've picked up from traveling or whatever that just isn't yours and it doesn't feel right. And right. I'll know from the EQ perspective if someone's ready to hear that. Yeah. But otherwise, I think it is just like, go be in nature and like mm -hmm. let nature give you those negative ions and mm -hmm. give it the positive ions so you can balance back to yourself. There sometimes is this public perception of if you get to a C-suite level, oh, yes. like your problems are solved. Mm -hmm. You have a big paycheck. All is good. Like you right. must have life figured out. Yeah. And my experience is humans are humans are humans. Mm -hmm. doesn't really matter what your title is. doesn't really matter what, how big your office is. Yeah. Although this one is really nice, <laughs> <laughs> you know. but you know, the bottom line is <clears throat> you, it's maybe a different subset of problems. I don't know, but how, like, where do you see executives having the greatest struggles? And I, and I know it's a generalization cause I'm oh, sure it's question. different for everybody, mm -hmm. but is it like physical health? Is it relational? Is it financial? Is it spiritual? Is it, you know, EQ, IQ? Like, where do you see the heaviest yeah. burden when people get to that level that everyone else might think they've made it? Like, yeah. what's the reality of that? Well, I think one of the things that I, um, people always ask me this question, like as an executive coach, like what were people asking? So it's a really yeah. good question. I think it's profound. They were always asking this question, am I enough? Mm -hmm. So I do think that there is parts that you have to check within yourself. Is it like clearing the next level, like yeah. it's a video game or something like yeah. I made it to level 13 and now I'm like financially completely secure, right. but maybe like to your point, their, their physical health has suffered yeah. because they never gave themselves permission to step away from their desk to get work done yeah. or to get their workout in, to get time for themselves. They're yeah. just like, I just have to stay here and have to finish this because somebody needs me. Right. And I think that they have this belief that not that they're better than others, but they're mo they're stronger. Okay. That I can save you. Yeah. If you just let me. They're good and, fixers. Right. They're good yeah. fixers. Yeah. And they're they're often very highly emotionally intelligent and very high performers. Yeah. But it really is this am I enough? And then they realize like externally, I've been looking for the answer outside of myself mm -hmm. instead of inside of myself. Mm -hmm. And so my executive coaching, the idea was just like, how do you come back in? Mm -hmm. How do you get mm -hmm. your answer from inside yourself? Right. And that is through like physical activity. That is through like spiritual practice, whatever that right. is for you. If it's like mantras or chants or meditation or running in nature right. or walking in nature, right. that is like, you know, having human connection. Yeah. And I think also this part about like being able to be vulnerable with someone and opening up and say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And are those words hard to say for most executives? Would you say? I think it is. Yeah. I think, I think they can say it in the coaching session, mm -hmm. but then like what we coach them on a lot is like, can you say that to your boardroom? Yeah. Can you, cause honestly, if we look at the economic situation now, mm -hmm. nobody knows what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. If you were making your plans for 2020 in January and we had this <laughs> thing called now. the <laughs> pandemic hit yeah. us, it just like that all had to change. Right. And I think the most successful leaders were the ones that could say, we don't know. Yeah. And we need you to give us information mm -hmm. as people who interact with customers or mm -hmm. like people in this situation. So I do think it is everyone kind of had their different one. If I were to pick one, it was usually their relationships that were suffering. Okay. So they didn't have good relationships with their children because they were trans tra traveling all the time yeah. or their partners or they didn't have partners or that saying it's lonely at the top yeah. was a hundred percent something I resonated with and yeah. could hear a lot of them say. Yeah. And the second I'd say is physical health. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Do you think the great resignation has 
change that? Do you think because of the pandemic, because of the great resignation, people are willing to be more open and vulnerable? I do see it. Yeah. I really think about the great resignation as the great reevaluation. Yeah. I really feel like people were trying to figure out the significance in their life. So I think we chase success for a long time. Yeah. And that was like, if you look at social media, like everything is awesome. Kind of like that Lego movie, like everything is awesome, <laughs> awesome. Like, but yeah. it's really not. Cause it's like the, the heroic efforts that people are doing right. to make it awesome is draining. Yeah. And so I think the great resignation was really this reevaluation and this return to ourselves. Yeah. I remember one time I was in this all hands meeting um, at Salesforce and there's, you know, 80,000 people were invited yeah. to this net. Yeah. This is like the whole company. Oh, my word. And so, I'm just giving this big presentation on the roadmap and the future of this specific product. Yeah. And then his cat pepper jumps up on the keyboard. <laughs> and it was just oh, this I moment. That. I felt like yeah. it was this moment of humanizing, like yeah. common humanity of all of us. Yeah. And I do think that people learned to say, I don't know. Yeah. I think Brene Brown's work has been really instrumental in the power of vulnerability. Yeah. How do we, um, how would we create more inclusive cultures? Because yeah. just what's inclusive to Tara as a Midwest girl is an inclusive someone in Germany right. or, you know, my team's global now and they all have different values for their culture that they live in. Right. So I think it was, this more expansive sense of self that came in Mm -hmm. and understanding that we maybe didn't have to always be in person to be effective or traveling Mm -hmm. to be effective, Mm -hmm. which honestly, if I looked at some of the people I was coaching at that time that were traveling every week, they were so grateful that they did not have to get on that plane every week to go to wherever. And now they could have these customer conversations in their house and they could go to their kid's soccer game or hockey game or whatever the game was. And I just, I feel like what we're coming to as a humanity Mm -hmm. in corporate America, which is really the vantage point I have. Mm -hmm. And I think that this might not be true everywhere, but from where I see the world of let's do things that matter. Yeah. Let's not just do things to do things because it's like check a box. Like we should travel this customer and do this. Maybe that customer doesn't even want to meet with us because they have their own things going on. Right, right. But it's like, how can we drive outcomes and results instead of just these things that we've always done? Right. So I do think it's shifting. I think that we're becoming more human centered leaders. Yeah. I think that I, I tell my team all the time, like, I don't know the answer to this because the problems we're trying to solve aren't like this process, like do these five right. things and the outcome is going to yield this. Right. It's like, these are like a kaleidoscope. And when I look at it today, it's green and blue. And when I look at tomorrow, it's yellow and orange. Yeah. And it just like, we need to collaborate. And then I think just when I say, I don't know, then they say, we don't know either. Right. Right. But we can, we can talk through it together. We can bring in other partners. Right. We can have a collective conversation about something that's going to make it exponentially better because of the collective genius Mm -hmm. of the whole. Is there a country that you have found to be like just doing this the best, like doing conscious conversations, psychological safety, um, spiritual health, like mindfulness, intuition, like, is there a country? And I know this is definitely a generalization. So I'm saying with a little, you know, disclaimer in there, but like generally speaking, culturally, yeah, they're just, that's just kind of how they live life. Yeah, I did. I worked with India a lot when I was a leader at Target. And I think that they're really good at practicing prayer and meditation and centering to their values value system Mm -hmm. and taking the time they need to celebrate their holidays, which I think is amazing. Uh, I do think that there is a definite spiritual component to how they live their life. Mm -hmm. And even like the Eastern medicine versus Western medicine, like if they are more into like acupuncture or alternative healing ideas or the power of intention, like I do see that more. I do think that if I look at my team right now, there, I feel that's my job as a leader to kind of drive that. Mm -hmm. And I think in the U.S., we're making really good strides to incorporate more of this wellness practice into our lives. And what I think the other countries are phenomenal at is taking time off. Like some of these countries have eight weeks off. 
like or more mm-hmm. and mandatory and it's mandatory yeah. and they have to take it yeah. and i think this is dreamy yeah. that you could literally instead of pushing 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 yeah. like we do in the in for sure in the us yeah. right yeah. you could say i'm going to drive outcomes mm-hmm. i think that's what the shift is when i look at the global perspective it's not just i clocked 50 hours this week or 40 right. hours or 60 right. or whatever the number is. But these were the three things that I had to get done with my customers and I did them. Yeah. And as a leader, I always say, you do this right. outcome, you're driving for results. How you get those, I'm not your micromanager. I don't right. need to like tell you right. how to it do it. It has to be from you're... 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Through Zoom and you yeah. have this many calls. Yeah. Like those are like old things, but I think there's becoming more of this like intangible way to measure mm. these things. Um, mm-hmm. And and so to your point about corporate wellness, I think that, yeah, they're, I think people are opening up to it because mm-hmm. we're seeing it. Even like at Davos in the World Economic Forum, I just listened to a podcast that Adam Grant did on um, should we have a four-day work week? Yeah, yeah. And it was so fascinating because, again, it was like we – they're trying this. Mm-hmm. Like at United mm-hmm. Arab Emirates, they did it in their governments, and it actually created more productivity. productivity yeah. And, you know – even in the 30s, you were talking about the Kellogg's when Kellogg's went from like six days to five days and how yeah. productivity went up and yeah. just all these things that really do like if we can get out of doing so much and right. go into being, yeah. I think that is something we, something we all can learn. It's critical. And yeah. practice. We'll return to Rebel and Be Well in just a moment. But first, a few words about our sponsors. I want to say a special thank you to everyone at Self Esteem Brands. We are grateful for the recording space and support you have provided to our podcast platform and team. You can find more information about Self Esteem Brands in the show notes. We appreciate and savor every sip of Dry Farm wines during our podcast conversations and every event at the Point Retreats. To find out more about Dry Farm wines, find their link in our show notes. Thank you, Paddle North, for being our preferred Minnesota based brand and company. We honor every memorable paddle. To find out more information about Paddle North, find their link in our show notes. The Point Retreats and Rentals is situated roughly 30 minutes outside Brainerd, Minnesota. The property's private peninsula boasts over 1,500 feet of stunning shoreline spanning three lakes on the pristine whitefish chain of lakes. Whether you need time to renew, reset, or reconnect, we have a space that can host your family, group, or team. Click on the show notes to find out more about the Point Retreats and the Point Rentals. So what does well-being like tangibly look like for your team? Like how do you incorporate that in maybe like the physical realm? Like how do you help people practice that or incorporate that? What's what tools do you have? Yeah. So I think that a lot of the the headquarters buildings at SAP actually have workout facilities and they have classes that they lead. So they'll do yoga classes or weight classes or circuit classes or whatever. Um, and I think this is true probably for a lot of cor- big corporations. Yeah. Salesforce did that too. Yeah. Um, but what I think a lot of my team is remote, yeah. so they don't necessarily go into the office okay. every day, but it's just this permission to take the time they need to step away from their desk during the day. Mm-hmm. Um, we actually do talk about wellness in our um, team meeting. So like all the components of it, but um, you know, just interesting, like some, one guy on my team is a football coach, a soccer yeah. coach. Yeah. And um, he has like, you know, just great ideas on how he moves his body. Mm-hmm. Some people are swimmers, some people, you know, do other things, but I think as a leader, as leaders, we don't have to be super prescriptive about that, Yeah. but just, I think doing it and modeling it is really important. So I'll say, you know, I teach classes at Lifetime and I have usually in the evenings, but sometimes someone will need a sub and during the day I'll just put on my Slack message, like, Hey, teaching a class from this time to this time. So it won't be available. But then it's like, I'm modeling what I'm asking you to do, not just, I'm sort of veiling permission, like, go do what you want. Right. But then you don't really feel like, but she's not. She's not doing it. So I probably really shouldn't, even though she said I can. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Which is so important. I love that you still do that because I'm sure that's, that takes some effort on your part to make sure that you stay in a space where you keep that as an option for you. Because it's like, so you just recognize it's so important for you. And you know, <clears throat> when I was back in uh, healthcare as a healthcare administrator, yeah. it was about 10 years ago, and I used to literally 
put on my calendar one-on-one -on -one meeting and VIP one-on-one -on -one meeting. Make it sound very important. Was it you? And it was me. <laughs> Just like I go to the gym, which now I mean, I VIP. literally had to hide it for, the, for like a year or two. And I carried the skill. I'm like, oh, I'm such a bad leader. Yes. And it took me a little while to release that and tell the team, and then give them permission to do the same. Because I'm like, this is crazy. We're leading and taking care of forty thousand patients with a disease that's really directly related to lifestyle. Chronic disease. And is I have to like feel like I have to yes. hide the fact that I'm trying to not get that disease. Like how backwards is that? Right. So I think that yes. permission of lead by example, like do as I say mm -hmm. um, and as I do yes. is really important. Yeah. Which you've incorporated. And I think that physical activity is so important for all the things that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. But it's also like mental health, right? Yeah. And, and there's a ton of research on this. It's like the byproduct of your muscles contracting is like antidepressant, anti-anxiety, mm -hmm. because it crosses your blood-brain barrier. Yeah, your endorphins are yeah. going, your dopamine is flowing, like yes. your serotonin is moving, like all the good yes. things are happening. You're just a better human yeah. in yeah. all aspects if you can yeah. have that, that activity. Yeah. yeah. So what do you see happen in your fitness classes? What do you observe for people like when they walk in halfway through and then when they're done? In terms of like, how is it a big transformation? Like when you, cause you're so oh, good at reading people and like the yeah. energy in the room and like, you know, just understanding kind of the group that you've just pulled together and yeah. having to go, okay, here's where we're starting. Here's where I want to yeah. get you. Like, how yeah, you well, that? I think that's a, that's a good question, Krista. I think what's interesting. So I teach cycle as well as weight classes. Yeah. And I think that I get a lot of dirty looks during class, yeah. like the warm up's great. And then I'm pushing people to be a better version of themselves. So I'm asking them to push past a point of comfort yeah. and I get lots of dirty looks during class yeah. and I always say, hate me now, love me later. <laughs> yeah. And then at the end of the class, you know, I'll say, how was that? Like, did you feel like you pushed past a limit that you thought you had right. and they'll woo and they'll be so excited and high five each other yeah. because I do think that we don't like to be discomfort, mm -hmm. discomfort. We don't want to put ourselves in situations like that. But when we're in group fitness together and when everyone else is doing it, it's like, okay, yeah. I you can kind of like this. pull each other up to do it. Yeah. yeah. And it's like this limit that we believed. Like if I say, you know, we're going to do eight more bicep curls and they've been doing them for a while and their right. biceps are dying. Yeah. And I say eight more and they roll their eyes. I mean, they're exasperated. Yeah. But then after they're done and they set their barbell down, they are literally triumphant mm -hmm. looking. And I think mm -hmm. that's the point of working out is like you are breaking through a barrier that yeah. you thought you had and you didn't right right you're so our bodies are so strong so yeah. strong i think there's a study that um the navy seals did i don't remember who led it but it was when the navy seals yeah right like mentally toughest like uh -huh. physically toughest beings on the yeah. planet when they said they thought their body was done and they couldn't do any more of this physical exertion, yeah. they still had, when they measured their mitochondria function, 60%, 6-0% of mitochondria function to produce more energy for the task. Wow. I tell my class that too. I'm like, you yeah. think these biceps hurt? Yeah. Try being a Navy SEAL once. And <laughs> <laughs> well, I guarantee you, you'll have a different I'm outlet. sure your mitochondria yeah. are fine. <laughs> That's that's a really interesting story. I haven't heard of that yeah, one, yeah. but that's that's very interesting. Yeah. And it kind of prepares you for life, right? Yes. Like, yes. We're all going to have moments in time where it's like, yeah. oh, this just feels like I cannot mm -hmm. push any farther. Like right. I've hit my max. And it can yeah. be, you know, personal life. It can be professional life. It can be a combination of both yeah. of them. And if you can pull on that reserve of like, oh, I remember that. I didn't think I could do that. Totally. And I did that. Yeah. Like it prepares your body and your mind and your psyche yes. to be able to do that again. And it's intention, right? Yeah. You're also like creating this intention that is possible yeah. and then you believe it's possible. And yeah. so it is. And so it is. And so, yes. it, be, so it is. Yeah. So, so is. have you had any hard health lessons in your life? Like what's your hardest health uh, moment? So I do feel like I've been blessed to be really healthy and I've been always intentional about my health. Yeah. Some of the things that I've actually had to struggle with um, in terms of knowing when not to work out yeah. or knowing when not to push my body. Yeah. And actually, so I feel like the universe always gives you these little like nuggets of wisdom mm -hmm. from when you least expect mm -hmm. it. So this woman came into my um, class the other day and she said, Tara, do you ever just have downtime? Mm. And I was—I had just come back from Vienna. I was mm. so tired. Mm. I mean, I was still jet lagged. It takes just a long time to adjust back and forth from right. that. Right. And I thought to myself, "Gee, that was a—that was the universe giving you a direct message mm. to take time for yourself." Yeah. So, in terms of 
like just feeling really run down and yeah. not like my body can't heal. Yeah. It's like, Tara, you don't have to over index on pushing and moving your body all the time. Right. Like sometimes I'll just ask my body like intuitively, do you want to go for a five mile run? <laughs> I'll <laughs> lean back and say no. And then I'll say, do you just want to walk with a friend for a few miles? Yes, yes. I do. Well, it's this whole concept that why we started the point. It was just really to give people, people permission to take care of themselves. Cause as I mentioned in healthcare, you just have, at least historically, I think it's yeah. improving, but you've had so little of that. Right. And I, and I don't even think it's really just healthcare. I think yeah. it's so many yeah. industries now. Like, I think you are a rare gem of a leader who as is so far along in this journey. And I think you're sprinkling more of that wisdom everywhere that you go and yeah. including our circle. Yeah. Um, but permission goes a long way. It it's does. like, it Oh, she said I should do that. Like, I should do that. She's the teacher. <laughs> the and I'll, I'll often say, like, yeah. I am not the boss of you, so do what yeah. you want. But I invite you to or maybe I can take be the it. boss of you if you need me to be. Yeah. If you just want 60 minutes to have someone tell you what to yeah. do, I get yeah. it. I like yeah. that about group fitness, too, when I'm taking in class. Yeah. 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 yeah so yeah. I think it's a beautiful gift. So yeah. what are three of your, like, health habits that are pretty non-negotiable? You're like, I don't care if I'm in Vienna or China or Minnesota like or yeah. my cabin. Like, these are my three non-negotiable health habits for That's my good. well-being. Really good. So I, I feel like the three for me are sleep. Yeah. So we always kind of joke in our circle that I love sleep so yeah. much. And I try to get eight to nine hours every night. Yeah. Now, when I'm traveling, that is always harder only because I can't sleep. Mm -hmm. um, but I think sleep is honestly the most important thing we can do for our body. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, there's so much research around this, right? How bad it is chronically for you to be, be sleep deprived, shift workers, and like the impact yeah. on their overall well being. So, sleep, um, like my, I'll just say to my family, like, hey, I know it's 8.30, but I just got back from London and I'm going to sleep for like 14 hours now. And then I'll feel like I can center back. And yeah. I think like those numbers are just my numbers and everyone's sleep needs are much sure. different. But sleep for me is something I prioritize over anything yeah. over, you know, just even I love time with friends, but I will still yeah. excuse myself at a reasonable time to just yeah. make sure I can get rest. Yeah. And especially with my, I wake up a lot of times at five or 5.30 for sure. these global meetings now. So sleep, love it. Um, the second, I think, is physical activity. Mm -hmm. I do feel that I try to move my body in some way every day. Mm -hmm. So that could be I'm walking my dogs or it could be that um, I'm on a conference call that's in all hands and I'm not a leader or participating mm -hmm. and I can just listen to it. Mm -hmm. Then I'll just go on the Peloton and have my laptop with me. Yeah. Um, so I think weights are really important as we age and sarcopenia and like we're losing 1% of our muscle mass by the time we turn 33, unless you're really like lifting weights and then protein. So the third thing is really nutrition. I think what I've learned from Dr. Gabriel Lyons, who's one of the researchers on protein, is that we're really deficient as a society in protein. And when I started to, so she, her recommendation, like at the low end is one gram for every pound of body weight, yeah. which sounds crazy, right? That seems like a lot of protein, yeah. but her advice that I, I don't always achieve my weight in grams sure. um, with protein, but I always try to load my first meal of the day to be protein rich yeah. with a smoothie, mostly with yeah. So I can just put in some, you know, plant-based pro protein, which is normally what my body does really well with yeah. and um, try to do like 40 to 50 grams first meal yeah. of the day. Yeah. And that really does help me not be hungry later. Yeah. It also helps me feel like my blood sugars are aligned, as you know, yeah. so many things you've taught me, so many things about blood sugar and, um, you know, and just, yeah. So I'd say those are the three things. Yeah. And then walking after I eat, like if yeah. we, after Thanksgiving, like I made the whole family go for a walk yeah. just to kind of process those carbs and like mm -hmm. let our muscles take in that glucose instead of having that, our blood sugars be crazy. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So I just try to do like little things like that, that are that add up really, really important really to me. Things. Yes. Yeah. At the end of the day. Yeah. yeah. Those are all fantastic health habits and yeah. really important for metabolic health, which, you know, we're, you're a little younger than I am, but like, as you get to the second half of life, like everything just takes a little bit more intention. <laughs> just roll with it. <laughs> yes. Much yes, younger audience. So <laughs> much younger. <laughs> it's like yeah. two months, but I'm kidding. It's more than that, but, but it does matter. I really yes. found like, I have to be way more intentional, those things. And, and everybody yes, will have a little different agree. journey in that, but yes, those small things make a really big impact in the long run. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, those are great goals. And I know I, ha I worked with a functional medicine doc, Dr. Ben House, who's phenomenal. And he oh. said, you know, Krista, 
you need to get 16 um, servings of vegetables. And it was like, I think it was like 100 grams of protein. And I was like, <laughs> and he's like, and then tell me if you're still hungry. And I'm like, I think I'm going to tell you that I'm like sick, actually. <laughs> like, I don't think I can physically do that. I'm only going to be chopping vegetables my right, whole day. Right, <laughs> exactly. Like, I have just, this is my new full time job. Balls, yeah. just <laughs> That's when I go off the video on Zoom. I'm like, sorry. It's my eighth serving of vegetables and protein. I have to get in. Right. But the truth is, like, it just takes um, a lot more than I think we realize, especially yeah. the way that we I agree. tend to eat and live here in the U.S. Well, so. And how the soil is so deficient of nutrients. I mean, yeah. Dr. Zach Bush, one of my favorite yeah. thought leaders on this subject, was talking about how. Um, our grandparents yeah. would have just had to have one orange to get the the amount of like nutrients from that orange. And today we have to have eight. Yeah, it's crazy. It is pretty amazing just yes. how differently. And I, yeah, I mean that's something else like we could podcast for hours on, right? <laughs> but truthfully, know. it's yeah. <clears throat> where we're headed in terms of you know how we produce our food is going to multiply that by. Yeah, you know, tens and tens and hundreds, right? Yeah. Because everything is being so much more genetically produced and mm -hmm. modified, and yeah, so it's different. Yeah. It's very different. Um, true. So there's a lot of different like tricks and tips you can do with that. But Zach Bush yeah. is a great thought leader yeah. in that arena. Yeah, I do love is that. he one of your well-being thought leaders? Yes, I, yeah, he's probably my favorite. Although I would say there's a culmination of a lot of amazing thought leaders that yeah. I usually um, have curated through the Drew Pruitt podcast. Okay. I love our Dr. Rungan Chatterjee has yeah. a lot of amazing guests too. He's so good. I do love Dr. Zach Bush mm -hmm. and his gut microbiome and the whole piece around that and how important it is to restore that for your ultimate well being. And there's like all kinds of, you know, good things that happen in our gut, our immunity, um, our like just dopamine and all those yeah. things. I also love, um, you know, some of his guests that's been, that have been on there. So. Yeah. Just um, Dr. Gabriel Lyons, we talked yeah. about, Kara Fitzgerald's, yeah. um, just these people that are talking about um, women's health is something that I'm, especially in the perimenopausal phase that I'm in in my life. Um, Dr. Stephanie Estima around hormones and like all those components. So I feel like there's so many podcasts are probably my favorite way because then I could be moving. I can be yeah. walking my dogs, running, like working out and listening or driving yeah. um, to hockey games, which is happening constantly. All the time. Um, yeah. All the time. yeah. <laughs> and listening. And then my yeah. son can listen on the way back yeah. and like learn all these things. He'll be a better husband someday because he'll be like, I remember this. So yeah. healthy. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever listened to Sarah Gottfried, Dr. Sarah oh, Gottfried? I love Sarah Gottfried. Yeah, Gottfried. She's another really good yeah. physician around She really health. is. Yeah. So she no, I, I'm right there with you. I'm on the same journey and it's, yeah. I've probably paying more attention now you know that I'm 48 than I did ever before because yeah. things just take that much more concerted mindfulness and effort yeah. right so yeah I and understand. there's amazing people out there to help us on the journey and like and just like I think having conversations like this like this is a real thing and yeah. we as women can yeah. talk about this or yeah. men are facing things and yeah. others are facing things too just depending on what stage they're in yeah. I think there's lots of good it creates more empathy too there. amongst your colleagues yeah. co-workers personal right. relationships yes. yes if you can just kind of go yeah. hey I get it I've been yeah. there like yeah. I know what you're going through <laughs> try listening to this <laughs> Maybe it'll be this. I know. I'm yeah. And then they're sharing great ideas back. Yeah. yeah it's like just sure. such a good information. That's one of the great things about the world we live in right now mm -hmm. with technology is there's so many. You can listen to Audible if you can't sit down and read or whatever. Yeah. You have a lot of different ways to access yeah. information. Yeah. We're not really in like an information deficit. It's more of just like a time deficit. Yeah. Time poverty is more yes. of a prior issue here now. But so if you had a mantra on your desk... Or if we would have been um, podcasting in the tattoo room, I would have asked if you were going to oh. put a mantra like on your body permanently in this tattoo room. Oh. Like, what would be your mantra? Like your well-being mantra. Um, what's yours? You know, I have a few. Because <laughs> it's like I can only ask these questions. <laughs> This is not about me, Tara. You signed a paper and said you would not ask me any questions. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, I have a few, and it, it kind of depends on what you like, what I was discussing or thinking about in particular. So for me, and this is kind of more of a relational, emotional, human connectedness mantra, and it's. Yeah. But I can apply it to well-being. And it sounds a little more competitive than I actually really am. Yeah. But it's the name of my dad's book. 
Oh, which yeah. is to win, play boldly. Yeah, I love that. And so, you know, boldly can sound really aggressive. Yeah. And my dad was, you know, definitely more of kind of an aggressive businessman, right? Like a big risk taker and did most of his life boldly, personally and professionally. Yeah. Um, but I saw, to me, so people, a lot of people look at him and think that's his professional life, and that's where I'm yeah. taking that. But, like, I saw it in his personal well-being. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he yes. only had one arm, and he never let things stop him. He continued to be as physically active as his body would let him be yeah. for many years. And um, just his emotional intelligence I saw growing over the year, yeah. years. It had an insane IQ, but, like had an incredible spiritual life, um, in particular, you know, around his religious beliefs. So I like it boldly. Like he did life really boldly. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess you can say he played life really boldly. Um, you know, so So for me, actually do have a tattoo to my body too. Oh my gosh. That's a beautiful, it's beautiful. Thank you. Mine would be play, just play. Because there's a song that Delta Goodman has, and it's just called play. Yeah. And there's this, these excerpts in it, and I'm not sure who the voice is saying this, giving this lecture, but one of the things is we don't work the piano, yeah. we play the piano. Ooh. And I do think that if we can approach yeah. our life yeah. as playful instead of so serious, mm-hmm. we are literally going to change how we show up, how other people feel interacting with us, yeah. and it can be fun. Like life can be fun. Mm-hmm. And so that is what I would say mine is. That's a really powerful one. And I think one we don't give enough credit to, but they've done a lot of studies on on people having a much higher engagement in like everything they do, right? If it involves play, if it involves fun. And we almost feel like that's gluttonous. Like, (laughs) what? Like, really? We we cannot play, Tara. (laughs) Like, we got stuff to do that's really important. That's what I love about Self Esteem Brand Studio. You know, their four core values are people, purpose, profits, play. And they play really well. It's amazing. Yeah, that's why we're up here because they're playing so well in the tattoo room and downstairs, right? But to allow permission for people to play. Play really invites a sense of belonging. Yeah. Because you don't, there's not rules if you're playing. Yeah. Like, if you say, play with this. It's not like you have to do it a certain way. Yeah. People can be themselves. They can explore. They can find yeah. this. They'll feel included because yeah. we want to pull everyone to play. I yeah. think those are all. Yeah. yeah good yeah, job. Self-esteem so, brands. That's I know. Beautiful. I know. So it is. Yeah. yeah. They, they set a good culture around that. Yes. But it's another. But it's one again. Another yeah. great leader is saying, I value it. When Grayson was probably four or five, mm-hmm. we were at the pool and he brought this dead dragonfly over to me. It wasn't yeah. moving. And he said, mom, you can heal this. Yeah. And I was like, well, okay. Yeah. So I put it in my hand and I literally, he was swimming and I was sitting on the edge of the pool, just holding on to this dragonfly, yeah. sending intention yeah. for like Archangel Raphael is this healer um, and just like any other healing entities and energies that can come in and heal this dragonfly mm-hmm. if it's for its highest good. Yeah. Literally 20 minutes later, I open like I just had my hand like this holding it. It just flew away. Wow. And I did this other times like out at the cabin yeah. there was a dragonfly and I just like set this intention and held my hands yeah. above it and it yeah. flew away. So I think there's something powerful about the dragonflies yeah. and they represent manifestation. Mm-hmm. And I really think as we get closer to our up, bring our vibration mm-hmm. up, we're getting closer to the spiritual realms that can actually help us yeah. remember the power within us too. So I think that is beautiful. The dragonfly. So you can have a dragonfly in the word play. <laughs> Fly yeah. and play. Yeah, right. There we go. Exactly. Yeah. But exactly. I love that. That's a beautiful yeah. story. I'd love to see you in a boardroom. So I'd be like, is she going to play? Is she going to like tell you you've got an angel over your head? Or is she going to be like, I want to set this intention, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be badass, whatever you come in with. But I love it because you'll bring in things that like, I know it won't exist in every boardroom, but yeah. it's it exists here. And it's pretty, yes. pretty phenomenal that you took time out to be here. Well, it was my so, pleasure. I want to say thank you for being here. Thank you for being an intentional, kind, love, warming hu- human. Um, yeah, you've definitely made a huge impact on my life. Mm. 
personally and professionally, and I think many, many others who I know, and a lot of people I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but thanks for sharing your wisdom, and mm -hmm. just keep going out in the world and, like, spreading more of you. Like, we need it. So, just, Aww. it's beautiful. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me, and I could echo all those things back to you about how amazing you are as a human and a heart-centered human. So, I really enjoyed our conversation. Yeah, thank you. Me too. Yes. All right. Thank, thank you, friend. You. That was awesome. <laughs> I want to say a special thank you to everyone at Self-Esteem Brands, the parent company of Anytime Fitness, Waxing the City, Bar Method, Stronger You Nutrition, and Base Camp Fitness. We are grateful for the recording space and support you have provided to our podcast platform and team. You are a true example of what it means to rebel and be well. You can learn more about Self-Esteem Brands via the link shared in the show notes below. We appreciate and savor every sip of Dry Farm Wines during our podcast conversations and every event at The Point Retreats. As a health and wellness platform, we are grateful to have a pure and unique wine that is free of sugar and additives, grown on small family farms, and brings a bright and soulful and vibrant glass of wine to share with the community we love. Cheers to our Dry Farm Wine friends and family. You can learn more and order your own bottles of Dry Farm Wine by clicking the link provided in the show notes below. That simple and serene moment when we glide across the lake at the Point Retreats on our Paddle North paddleboard is one of the most cherished moments. It's a gift when we and our guests blend into nature and lose track of time and space as we soar across the pristine whitefish chain of lakes. Thank you Paddle North for being our preferred Minnesota-based brand and company. We honor every memorable paddle that brings great clarity and balance. Click on the link provided in the show notes below to see all the incredible lake gear available with Paddle North. The Point Retreats and Rentals is situated roughly 30 minutes outside Brainerd, Minnesota. The property's private peninsula boasts over 1,500 feet of stunning shoreline spanning three lakes on the whitefish chain of lakes. The Point property is owned by two purpose-driven leaders who share a strong desire to lead others to optimal health and well-being. Our team believes in proactive, modern-day health, shifting our mindsets to valuing quality of life in the same capacity as we value quantity of life. We aim for every experience at The Point to enhance and deepen your whole being health by providing many opportunities for well care during your stay. Whether you need time to renew, reset, or reconnect, we have a space that can host your family, group, or team. Click on the show notes below to find out more about the Point Retreats and the Point Rentals. Mm -hmm.